Thus, it is a great honor to present to you this evening this great, great man, Dr. Linus Pauling. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe that there will never again be a great war in the world, that there will never be a war in which the terrible weapons involving nuclear fission and nuclear fusion are used. I believe that it is the discoveries of scientists upon which the development of these terrible weapons was based uh, that uh, are now forcing us to move into a new period in the history of the world, a period in which war is abolished forever and disputes between nations are settled uh, by a system of international law based upon the principles of morality and justice. I know, of course, that there have been uh, many uh, peace workers in the world in the past. I remember Bertha von Suttner, born in 1843, who uh, received the Nobel Peace Prize in 1905 and died in 1914 before the uh, Second World War broke out. Uh, she was the author of one of the most popular books of the 19th century, the book Die Waffen Nieder down with arms. And I remember the American women, Jane Addams and Emily Green Balch, who 50 years ago founded, with other women, founded the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. The many organizations that have worked for peace in the world. I remember also the words of Norman Angel in 1910 who pointed out that in the 20th century, a war had changed in its nature to such an extent that no nation would benefit from war, not even the victorious nations. Despite this fact, there came along the First World War, despite the efforts of workers for peace, despite disarmament treaties that were made, despite what Norman Angel said, there came along the First World War. No one benefited from it. Uh, the victorious nations came out uh, damaged economically and, of course, with the loss of uh, hundreds of thousands or millions of their young men. But also the Second World War came along. And many people said that uh, it was inevitable that there be a third world war and a fourth world war, a fifth world war, that this is the nature of man, that improvement in weapons and the killing power of weapons would not change this situation. But indeed, uh, I believe that the situation has been changed and that we can understand why it has. In the First World War, 20 million people were killed, about 1% of the world's population. That uh, sacrifice was not enough. In the Second World War, about 50 million people were killed, about 2% of the world's population. That was not enough to cause war to be given up. But now, if there were to be a war, it may be that 50% of the world's population would be killed, or perhaps 75%. There is even the possibility that the human race would cease to exist. This has come about uh, because of an eventuality that was foreseen already 80 years ago by Alfred Nobel. Alfred Nobel was a chemist and chemical engineer, great industrialist, a brilliant man who invented dynamite 100 years ago and invented the uh, detonator the mercury, mercuric fulminate detonator to explode the dynamite. He made high explosive safe to use and contributed a great deal to uh, the uh, well-being of mankind uh, thereby. He also invented ballastite, uh, a, a propellant to use in uh, great naval guns and in uh, military uh, weapons uh, generally. Uh, this may have bothered him. At any rate, he became much interested in the question of the possible abolition of war. And he said, uh, 
I would like to invent a substance or a machine with such tremendous powers of mass destruction that war would thereby be made impossible forever. Well, it took a long time uh, for this to be done, but after some 60 or 70 years, it was done. There were two great discontinuities that took place in the uh, methods of waging war in the nature of weapons. First in 1945, second in 1954. On the 6th of August, 1945, there was exploded over Hiroshima a new kind of weapon that had not been used before. Whereas most of the Second World War was fought with great one-ton blockbusters, a thousand pounds of, or two thousand pounds of TNT, uh, great bombs, one of which could destroy a building such as this, covering an acre of ground and kill many hundreds of people. And uh, a million of these great bombs were used each year, a million tons of high explosive used during each year of the six years of the Second World War. This one bomb that exploded involved a few pounds of a new kind of explosive, uranium-235, separated from ordinary uranium by a method of gaseous diffusion. Two pounds of this material exploded over Hiroshima on the 6th of August 1945 with an explosive power equal to that of 20,000 tons of dynamite. The bombs had become 20,000 times more powerful. We had entered upon the era of the atomic age, and Albert Einstein said at once, now that weapons exist that can destroy a small city such as Minneapolis, and I don't know why he happened to say Minneapolis, but this is what he said, could destroy a small city such as Minneapolis and kill most of the people in it, and now that we have rockets that can carry atomic bombs of this sort from one country to another, we are forced to abandon the institution of war and to replace it by world law, a system of world law based upon reason. Well, some years went by, and on the 1st of March, 1954, the United States exploded the first modern weapon. This was the first super bomb, the first three-stage nuclear bomb uh, involving nuclear fission, nuclear fusion, nuclear fission. It had about 10 pounds of plutonium as its trigger. This would be a Hiroshima-type atomic bomb by itself. At the temperature of 50 million degrees caused by the nuclear fission of the nuclei of these plutonium atoms, the material in the second stage undergoes the reaction of nuclear fusion when the light nuclei combine with one another to form a nuclei of helium. The lithium and deuterium nuclei react. Uh, liberating seven times as much energy per pound. And the second stage involves about 200 pounds of lithium deuteride. It gives a 500-fold increase in explosive energy. Then the third stage takes place. This is the nuclear fission in 1,000 pounds of ordinary uranium metal, a shell of metal around the lithium deuteride. This again doubles the explosive energy so that the total energy of explosion of this bomb, the bikini bomb of the 1st of March 1954, was 20 million tons of TNT, the equivalent of 20 million tons of TNT. This bomb is called a 20 megaton bomb. Megaton meaning a million tons of TNT. This bomb had more explosive energy than all of the explosives used in all of the wars fought in the whole history of mankind, including the First and Second World Wars, the Korean War, and all earlier wars. One such bomb exploded over any city in the world would destroy it essentially completely and kill uh, practically all the people in the city and uh, many of them in the neighborhood, up to 200 miles away in the direction in which the wind is blowing. One 20 megaton bomb exploded over New York would smash it flat over an area 20 miles in diameter. On a clear day, it would set fire to houses 50 miles away in every direction, causing a great firestorm. 
killing many people, and then the radioactive fallout uh, would kill many more. In the case of a ground burst, and it is expected that the weapons would be used as ground burst, which means uh, exploding within two miles of the earth so that the fireball, four miles in diameter and with the temperature of the sun, would reach the surface of the earth, vaporizing thousands of tons of soil, steel, concrete, human beings, and other materials. And then as the uh, fireball continues to expand and to cool, this vaporized material would condense into little droplets, uh, entrapping the highly radioactive fission products, a thousand pounds of fission products produced in the first and third stages, the fission stages of the explosion of the bomb, and causing them to fall to earth within a few hours, uh, and contaminating an area of about 10,000 square miles with radioactive fallout, this local radioactive fallout, to such an extent that most of the people within this area, perhaps 50 miles wide and 200 miles long, extending in the way the wind is blowing, would be subjected during the first day to an amount of radiation much greater than that that causes death by acute radiation sickness. The little bullets of high energy radiation going through the cells of their bodies would damage these cells in such a way as to cause nausea and fever, internal bleeding and the death uh, in a few days. In general, it is thought that about half of the people killed in a nuclear war would die of a blast, fire, and immediate radiation effect, and about another half, the other half, uh, by the local fallout. The other day, a month ago about, President Johnson said that if there were to be a great nuclear war, a hundred million Americans would be killed on the first day, the day of the nuclear war. He didn't go on to say that the damage done by the local fallout would cause the rest of the Americans, another 90 million or most of them, to die a few days later or a few weeks later, but this is what would happen. We have to conclude now that uh, war must be abandoned. I have mentioned what one 20 megaton bomb would do. Uh, the United States has exploded a good number of them, the Soviet Union a good number of them, and uh, Great Britain one or two. France is planning to explode one in the South Pacific before long unless something happens to prevent it. The Soviet Union exploded a uh, small bomb, a 50th of a megaton, a thousandth the size of these big ones, just a Hiroshima-type atomic bomb, about six weeks ago. And uh, my estimate is that within three years, unless something is done about uh, this matter by bringing the Chinese People's Republic into the community of nations without her brandishing this uh, nuclear uh, revolver, uh, the uh, China will explode a, a super bomb, a 20 megaton super bomb. It took the United States nine years uh, to explode the first super bomb, the Soviet Union you know, five years, and I think uh, China three years, my estimate is. Now, thousands of these great bombs have been constructed and are uh, stored in the nuclear stockpiles uh, of the great nations of the world, the United States and the Soviet Union. Each, each of these nations has a stockpile of weapons great enough to kill everybody on Earth if the weapons were to be used for this purpose. If a nuclear war were to be fought in the Northern Hemisphere, there is little doubt that most of the people in the Northern Hemisphere would die. What would happen to the people in the Southern Hemisphere if the bombs exploded only in the Northern Hemisphere is hard to estimate. I think that the worldwide fallout uh, from all of these nuclear explosions would cause uh, most people to die 10 or 15 or 20 years earlier than they would otherwise by producing a great increase in the incidence of cancer. In addition, when I have tried to estimate what damage would be done to the pool of human germplasm, I have usually ended up with a very rough estimate that about 50% of the children born to the survivors, these being people in the southern hemisphere, uh, would be uh, grossly uh, defective, have gross physical or mental defect, uh, but uh, I don't know. This estimate may be either too high or too low. It's very hard to say 
uh, what w with the reliability, impossible to say what would happen if there were to be a great nuclear war. My estimate of the magnitude of the stockpiles of nuclear weapons existing in the world today is 320,000 megatons. This is reasonable, I think, in view of various circumstances. We, the United States, for some years have been manufacturing plutonium at the rate of 200,000 pounds a year, up to last year. 10 pounds is enough for an atomic bomb or a super bomb. This is 20,000 bombs per year. And how many? Whether we have 100,000 stockpiled or not, I don't know. And how many of them are big bombs, I do not know for sure. On the 1st of January, 1960, Senator John F. Kennedy, this was before he was president, is that right? Yes, a year before he became president, said uh, that his estimate of the world stockpile was 30,000. Megatons. He didn't say his estimate was. He just said the world stockpile of nuclear weapons is 30,000 megatons. A year later, the scientists at the Pugwash Conference, the sixth Pugwash Conference, used 60,000 megatons as their estimate. Last, a few months ago, I received a letter from the secretary of uh, Grenville Clark, who is writing a book on this subject, another book about uh, nuclear war. Uh, saying, uh, I had said that there were 320,000 megatons of weapons in my Nobel Peace Prize address, but that President Johnson, a few months later, had said that there were 30,000 megatons, and had I made a mistake in my decimal point, uh, of course, uh, this was uh, really uh, hardly the proper thing to say to me, although my wife... <laughs> Every once in a while, my wife says, haven't you made a mistake in your decimal point to me? And I uh, have to accept that. Uh, <laughs> but I uh, wrote back and said that I thought that the, uh, well, that I hadn't made any mistake and that I would explain this and that perhaps uh, President Johnson, uh, no, since he no longer had uh, Jerome Wiesner as his science advisor, uh, may just have uh, uh, thought it was uh, best to repeat the statement that uh, Senator John F. Kennedy had made in 1960, forgetting that the world changes year after year. And in fact, you see, in 1945, at the end of the Second World War, there was about one megaton of explosives in the world. Fifteen years later, January 1960, President Kennedy said 30,000 megatons. This one megaton would be a, enough bombs to run the Second World War for a year. Uh, so it, we have gone from one to 30,000 in uh, 15 years. Now, if I remember correctly, that corresponds to doubling every year for 15 years. Isn't that right? The log of two is uh, 30103, not .30103, and uh, 15, 2 to the 15th, that would be 15 times 30103, that would be 3 times 15, 4.5, and you have a characteristic of 4 and a mantissa of 5, or else a mantissa of 4 and characteristic <laughs> of 5, whichever it is. At any rate, the, I remember that the log of 3 is not 0.48, not 0.476, something like that. So this means uh, uh, 3. And then with a characteristic or mantis of 4, you have to add 4 naughts, which gives 30,000. So 2 to the 15th power is about 30,000, all right. And this means doubling the, doubling the stockpile, the explosive power of weapons in existence uh, for that 15 years. And then a year later, it would have gone from 30,000 to 60,000. And a year later to 120,000. And a year later to 240,000. And now you are beginning to get uh, close to the reserves, to the rate at which plutonium, to uranium, not plutonium, there's plenty of plutonium, but the rate at which uranium was being stockpiled, and moreover, perhaps a bit of sanity began to creep into the world. So I have been satisfied to stop at 320,000 in my 
uh, estimates. And in fact, of course, there was an action taken last year by President Johnson and Premier Khrushchev, each of them through some sort of uh, agreement, not a treaty, uh, decreasing the rate of plutonium manufacture by 40%. Uh, this was significant, and of course, President Johnson cut down the uh, military budget of the United States by a billion dollars, and the Soviet Union immediately decreased their military budget by a million dollars for the year, last year. That was significant, too. The 320,000 megatons is enough. They don't need to make any more uh, bombs. It's enough, all right. I mentioned that one one-ton blockbuster would smash the buildings on an acre of ground, a block, you see, acre of ground. 320,000 megatons is the equivalent of 12 one-ton blockbusters for every acre of land surface on Earth, including Antarctica, Greenland, northern Canada, the Sahara Desert, and so on, as well as the places where there are people. Uh, a, a stick of dynamite can kill a number of people. One stick of dynamite. 320,000 megatons is the equivalent of 100 tons of dynamite for every person on Earth. Uh, that's 200,000 sticks of dynamite for every person on Earth. The Second World War was a six megaton war. Now you know it took six years to fight the Second World War. A megaton of TNT, a million tons of TNT, is uh, not uh, cheap. TNT, during wartime, when it's being manufactured in large quantity, costs 25 cents a pound. So a ton costs $500. A megaton would cost $500 million. That's a lot of money. 20 megatons, a 20 megaton bomb, TNT, uh, would cost uh, $10 billion then. Now this 20 megaton nuclear bomb uh, contains nuclear explosives costing $85,000. Plutonium costs $14 a gram to manufacture. It's the expensive material. All atomic and uh, super bombs cost the same amount, big ones and little ones, because they all require 10 pounds of plutonium as the bomb or as the trigger. $14 a gram, 4,537 grams would be $64,000 worth of plutonium. Then lithium deuteride costs uh, $28 a pound. Uh, 200 pounds would be $5,600 worth. Ordinary uranium metal, $17 a pound. 1,000 pounds is $17,000 worth. That's $85,000 for a 20, mega, a 20 megaton bomb, the equivalent of $500 million worth of TNT, $85,000 of explosive to kill 10 million people in New York and destroy the city, this wonderful city there, or any other city in the world. Now, uh, nowadays, a great war would be fought in one day. It takes 40 minutes for intercontinental ballistic missiles to go from the Soviet Union to the United States in the same length of time in the other direction, perhaps a few minutes less because of the prevailing winds. Uh, <laughs> it takes a few hours for great bombers to go either one direction or the other, carrying 50 megatons of bombs apiece. If there were to be fought tomorrow, in one day, a war equivalent in the explosive power of the weapons used to the whole of the Second World War, compressed, however, from six years into one day. And then on the following day, another war equivalent to the whole of the Second World War. And the following day, another Second World War, and the following day, another one, and so on, day after day, for 146 years, then the stockpiles of nuclear weapons would be used up. And you know, we've been in danger. You remember that uh, during the Cuba crisis, uh, we had 750 of our 1,600 SAC bombers on 15-minute alert, uh, ready to take off in 15 minutes, if the word came that they were to do so, to take off for the Soviet Union. Uh, they carry 50 megatons of bombs apiece. They may carry more now with uh, some redesign, making the bombs a little lighter in weight, uh, but uh, for given explosive power, 50 megatons is the standard amount that these 
or bombers carry, are supposed to carry. 50 times 750 gives 37,500 megatons. This is uh, twice as much, four times as much perhaps, as the amount of explosive required to kill everybody in the Soviet Union. 37,500 megatons is 6,000 times as much explosive as was used in the whole of the Second World War. Uh, how many megatons of bombs the Soviet Union was prepared to shoot back or fly back over the United States, I don't know. It only takes about half as much to kill off all the people in the United States as the Soviet Union because the area of the United States is only half as great as that of the Soviet Union. I can understand why it was that on the 6th of January 1960, President Eisenhower said, even after a great surprise nuclear attack on the United States, we could still destroy the Soviet Union completely. And three days later, Premier Khrushchev said, even after a great surprise nuclear attack on the Soviet Union by the United States, we could still destroy the, Soviet, the United States completely in the counterattack. And then, about three weeks ago, after the explosion of the uh, small atomic bomb by the Chinese People's Republic, uh, the Secretary of Defense McNamara uh, said, even after a great surprise nuclear attack on the United States, we could still destroy the Soviet Union and the Chinese People's Republic completely. <laughs> and uh, they, he could have gone on and say, we could destroy the rest of the world completely. But everybody would be killed, nevertheless, in the United States as well as in other countries where the nuclear war is fought. Uh, those who survived the blast fire, immediate radiation effects, and radioactive fallout would have to cope with uh, such problems as caused by the complete destruction of all cities and metropolitan districts and of all means of communication and transportation, the death of all livestock, and the gross radioactive contamination of all growing foods. It would with little doubt, to uh, be the end of civilization. I doubt that the survivors uh, could keep the civilization going with the damage done to the pool of human germplasm, and it might mean the end of the human race. No dispute between nations can justify nuclear war. There is no defense against nuclear weapons that cannot be overcome by increasing the scale of the attack. Uh, it would be contrary to the nature of war, I believe, for agreements to be made and to be adhered to limiting uh, the wars that would be fought. An agreement that only Hiroshima-sized atomic bombs would be used. No nation, great nation, would go down to defeat while her great bombs, a thousand times more powerful, remained uh, unused. And today, even little wars are dangerous because a little war may grow into a major war that would be a world catastrophe. The only sane policy for the world is to abolish war and to replace it by international law. I was happy when President Kennedy, on the 26th of September 1961, in his address before the United Nations, said, the goal of disarmament is no longer a dream. It is a practical matter of life or death. The risks inherent in disarmament pale in comparison with the risks inherent in a continuing arms race. And then he went on to say what the policy of the United States was, to make a bomb test treaty, to make treaties to stop the manufacture of nuclear weapons, then to make additional treaties to cut down on the sizes of the stockpiles, to make treaties to stop the manufacture of the vehicles for delivering these weapons, and then gradually to destroy these uh, vehicles, uh, these nuclear delivery uh, vehicles. And the start was made. Uh, the first goal that he set, that of a uh, treaty stopping the testing of nuclear weapons, was accomplished, not quite entirely, but almost accomplished by the 1963 Bomb Test Ban Treaty, banning the explosion of 
bombs in the atmosphere on the surface of the earth or in the oceans, uh, but allowing tests to be carried out underground. I think that we should try to achieve the goal of a complete bomb test treaty and also to get all of the nations in the world to sign it. At the present time, France and Chinese People's Republic are not signing them. Then we need to take other steps, as President Kennedy said, to prevent the spread of nuclear weapons to uh, nations that do not now possess them. We are now discussing the possibility of setting up a NATO multilateral force in which West Germany would play an important part. It is a fact that the main fear that the Soviet Union has is a fear of the West German militarists rather than a fear of the United States. And I think that it would be an act of folly to go ahead with the proposal to set up a uh, Nuclear, a NATO nuclear force of surface vessels fitted with rockets, with nuclear warheads, and with half of the 40% of each crew being from West Germany, 40% from the United States, 20% from another NATO nation, half of the vessels to have uh, West German commanders and half to have American commanders. This is the proposal. Chancellor. Adenauer, while he was still Chancellor of Germany, and discussing this proposal, which was first made by President Eisenhower in November 1960, said, and we must see to it that we can use these nuclear weapons without waiting to get permission from the President of the United States. Even now, after some years of discussion of this proposal, the question has not been clarified as to whether the West German commander would have the right to use the weapons without getting permission from the President of the United States. This is a dangerous situation. Any spread of nuclear weapons is a dangerous situation. I think that the way to handle the problem of Germany and Berlin, which is a, a hazard, a dangerous problem, is not remilitarization, but rather demilitarization along the lines of the Kennan plan or the Rapatsky plan with the boundaries of the nations, the integrity of the national boundaries guaranteed by the United Nations. Now, even the testing of nuclear weapons causes damage to human beings all over the world. This shows how uh, these weapons differ from the old-fashioned weapons from ordinary explosives such as TNT. 600 megatons of bombs have been tested. For a while, scientists had great difficulty in reaching agreement about the amount of genetic and somatic damage uh, probably done by the radioactive materials liberated by these bombs. But after years of uh, research and investigation and discussion, essential agreement has been reached. My estimate is that the fission products, carbon four, or the strontium-90, cesium-137, iodine-131, cerium-144, and so on, and the carbon-14 liberated in the bomb tests carried out so far, will in the course of time, if the human race survives and continues to populate the Earth, uh, cause a total of 16 million unborn children to be seriously damaged through gene mutations. This is uncertain. The number may be much higher or, or much lower. I think that this is the best estimate that we can make now. If the human race is, is wiped out in a nuclear war, the damage would be less because only 1% of this total damage occurs in the first generation, 5% of the fission product damage, and 3 tenths of a percent of the carbon-14 damage. Carbon-14 has a mean life of 8,000 years so that if the human race survives, there will be children living, children born 8,000 years from now with uh, gross defects because of our actions taken during, the, during recent years in exploding these 600 megatons of bombs. Of these 16 million children, many would be uh, caused to die, embryonic, neonatal, or childhood deaths, but many would be viable children with, however, gross physical or mental defect. In addition, it is my opinion that uh, even small amounts of high energy radiation are uh, uh, cancerogenic as well as mutagenic. 
Alternatists agree that these small amounts of high energy radiation are mutagenic. There's a difference of opinion about the cancerogenic action. If we accept to the principle that to the cancerogenic effect that is known to hold for large doses of high energy radiation uh, holds also proportion in proportion for uh, low intensity of high, high energy radiation, then the 600 megatons of bombs that have been tested so far can be estimated to uh, be damaging human beings now living to such an extent that 2 million of them will die 5, 10, or 15 years earlier, or 20 years earlier than they would otherwise, of leukemia, bone cancer, and other forms of cancer caused by the bomb test radioactivity and a much larger number in later generations. This two million figure applies just to the present generation. Now, the bomb test treaty was not made. The bomb test treaty was not made in 1959. Uh, negotiations began on the 31st, uh, 30th of October, 19. 58. The treaty was not made in 1959 or 1960 or the first eight months of 1961 because there was disagreement about uh, uh, detecting underground tests. The American seismologists said that uh, you couldn't de detect a test of uh, a bomb underground the size of the Hiroshima bomb. The Soviet scientists said that you could detect a bomb only a quarter or a fifth of the size of the Hiroshima bomb. And so the treaty was not made until uh, 1963. In the meantime, on the 28th of February, the 28th of September 1961, the Soviet Union resumed testing and the United States resumed testing a couple of months later. In this later period, Three times as much testing was done as had been done by the nations before then. So that the number of defective children, number of children sacrificed to the tests increased from 4 million to 16 million. 12 million, I estimate, 12 million children and uh, 1,500,000 people now living sacrificed because the simple solution of leaving the underground tests out of the agreement could not be found before during 1950. 59 or 1960 or early 1961. What a tragedy it is that the negotiators could not accept the sol this solution at that time, but uh, further testing went on. Now, France is planning to explode a bomb, a hydrogen bomb, which I surmise may be a 20 megaton bomb in the South Pacific. The Soviet Union will explode one, presumably, in a few years. If France explodes such a bomb, it will be at the sacrifice of 500,000 unborn children, assuming that the human race survives, and of 70,000 people now living, if I am right in my beliefs about the cancerogenic action of high energy radiation, radioactive fallout. Uh, I believe that this is justification for trying to prevent this bomb test from being carried out, and a Chinese bomb test of a great bomb. But France and China may go ahead in the next few years and explode uh, another 600 megatons of bombs, as much as the United States and the Soviet Union have, uh, corresponding to another 16 million unborn children, another 2 million people now living. We need to work to prevent this from happening. On the 17th, a couple of days ago, I read in the newspaper, the Cleveland Press, that the Atomic Energy Commission had analyzed the results of the recent underground nuclear bomb explosions in Mississippi and had found that the shock waves were four to six times stronger than expected. This means that they have found by this experiment that the Soviet seismologists were right and the American seismologists were wrong in their contentions in 1959 and 1960 about the detection of underground tests. And it may be that because of that error, uh, this extra testing of 450 megatons of bombs was made.
Why are we not making additional progress to our disarmament? I think that the bomb test treaty of 1963 may be considered by historians of the future as the greatest step, the greatest action ever taken by the governments of nations as the first of a series of treaties that will lead to the abolition of war. But the other treaties are slow in coming along. There has been a resolution that passed in the United Nations forbidding the putting or agreeing that nuclear weapons will not be put into orbit around the Earth. This is important. A treaty was made making Antarctica into a nuclear-free zone. That is important. But we need to take some further steps to make the world a less dangerous place than it is now. Some steps toward immobilizing the stockpiles of nuclear weapons that could destroy civilization. Why is there no further progress? Harold Wilson, now Prime Minister, said a month ago before the British elections that he, that it would not be possible for the United States, the Soviet Union, and Great Britain to make any significant disarmament agreements without having the Chinese People's Republic a signatory to the disarmament treaties and a participant in the disarmament negotiations. And I believe that too. I have never advocated unilateral disarmament for the United States or the Soviet Union. I think that Great Britain might as well give up her stockpile of nuclear weapons. It does not, it doesn't protect the British people. It only makes it certain that Britain would be destroyed if there were to be a nuclear war. But she'd be destroyed anyway. What it does do, the existence of this third stockpile increases the probability of outbreak of a nuclear war and makes the world a more dangerous place. But I don't advocate that the United States or the Soviet Union disarm unilaterally because I don't trust the militarists in either country. I'm sure I feel that they would uh, be almost certain to take advantage of a military imbalance if uh, a significant one exists that were to exist. Now the overkill capabilities are so great that it doesn't matter whether we have three times or four times or five times uh, the amount of nuclear explosive that the Soviet Union has. If the Soviet Union has enough to destroy the world, it doesn't matter whether they have uh, two or three times uh, the amount needed to destroy the world, or whether we have five or six times the amount needed, or 10 or 12 times the amount needed to destroy the world. Uh, we need to be doing something about these uh, weapons, and we can't move ahead. Uh, the United States and the Soviet Union cannot disarm, I believe, unilaterally with respect to the Chinese People's Republic. In some years, perhaps in 10 years, the Chinese People's Republic will be a great nuclear power with a stockpile of nuclear weapons great enough to destroy the world. And this will mean that uh, the world will be a more dangerous place than it is now if it continues. I regret that I cannot speak about China from my own observations. You know, the United States government forbids Americans uh, to travel uh, to the Chinese People's Republic. I can't think of anything more valuable for the United States than for Americans to visit the Chinese People's Republic and to find out what is going on there, but it is forbidden to do so by the government. But a friend of mine whom I saw just a week or two ago in Canberra, Sir Mark Oliphant, uh, Professor Sir Mark Oliphant had just returned from a month in, the, in the, the Chinese People's Republic. He and three other members of the Australian Academy of Sciences had gone there, although Australia, like the United States, does not extend a diplomatic recognition to the Chinese People's Republic. Uh, China is the second uh, uh, greatest uh, buyer of Australian goods. There's a great deal of trade between Australia and China, and uh, Australians can visit China. Uh, well, he reported that there is great enthusiasm in China, and especially after the rift with the Soviet Union. The Chinese people have embarked upon a do-it-yourself spree. And uh, Sir Mark Oliphant said uh, they are hardworking and have a lot of ability and uh, have set out to duplicate everything that has ever been done in the rest of the world. 
They are making atomic bombs and exploding them. Uh, they make uh, germanium, purified germanium for transistors and are transistorizing their instruments. Uh, their steel manufacture is approaching third place. I've forgotten just where it is, fourth perhaps in the world uh, now, among the nations of the world. And uh, there's no doubt that the Chinese People's Republic, uh, with more people than any other nation and a rapidly developing industrial capacity, is one of the great nations in the world. We have, in order to make the world a safe place, we must get all of the nations in the world into the United Nations, into the community of nations, but especially the Chinese People's Republic. I think that to work for the admission of Red China to the United Nations and for her having a place worthy of her stature as one of the great nations, a seat on the Security Council, uh, recognition of China by the United States, Australia, and those few other nations that do not recognize her is a, a, a way of working for peace and perhaps the best way at the present time. Now in the meantime, it is evident that it's going to be a long time before we are rid of nuclear weapons before we have achieved a significant degree of disarmament. It must involve, I don't advocate nuclear disarmament. I think we have to get rid of the institution of war. In the meantime, what can we do to make the world a safer place? I think that we could decrease the chance of outbreak of nuclear war significantly just by having United Nations observers in all of the nuclear control stations of the nuclear powers, and that this is a step that could be instituted rather quickly. But then a further step, which might be a permanent one for a long time, until we have got into the new world era, the next step that I propose is that uh, the great stockpiles of nuclear weapons be put under joint national and international control. That the Soviet stockpile be put under the joint control of the Soviet Union and the United Nations in such a way that the weapons could not be used except with the permission both of the uh, Prime Minister, the Premier of Soviet Union, and the Secretary General of the United Nations with Soviet personnel and United Nations personnel in parallel positions in all of the control stations, and similarly the American stockpile under joint control of the United States and uh, the United Nations. This would, of course, prevent uh, these weapons from being used except under some uh, very extraordinary circumstance. Uh, it is hard to imagine that the Secretary General of the United Nations would give permission for the weapons to be used. In the meantime, with these stockpiles of nuclear weapons immobilized, they would continue to act as they do now as a deterrent of war. Well, of course, uh, we need to get rid of small wars as well as great ones. This includes civil wars, uh, uh, guerrilla and insurrectionary wars. They are often characterized by extreme savagery and lead to a great amount of human suffering. Uh, but uh, are we to remove from an oppressed people in a country in which there is a dictatorial and oppressive government all hope of overthrow of this uh, dictatorial and oppressive government? Uh, for many, the only hope is that of overthrow by a bloody revolution. I don't like that. I don't like... Uh, to think that this is the only way of getting rid of a dictatorial government. Uh, and uh, I think, in fact, we are moving toward the time when, it, uh, when a revolution will not necessarily be uh, bloody. I think world opinion is coming to have an influence on uh, the great nations and the small nations. But I believe that it will, would be possible in the course of time, perhaps in uh, uh, two or three decades, to develop the body of world law to the point that uh, perhaps once a decade uh, some operation could be carried out that 
would permit the people in every nation to express themselves uh, by ballot, uh, supervised, say, by the United Nations, about their government, and to get rid of the government in any nation in the world uh, by uh, these bloodless means. Well, that will be a long time in the future, but yet in the course of time, it will, I believe, come. The, uh, there is something that could be done immediately to decrease the savagery of civil, guerrilla, and insurrectionary wars. And that is for the great nations of the world to abstain from to abandon their present policy of instigating and aggravating wars that are fought in the underdeveloped countries of the world. I am ashamed of the role that the United States plays in uh, South Vietnam now. I am ashamed that our government uh, rejected the recommendation of the Eight Nation Conference in 1954 that uh, South Vietnam be made into a neutral nation with a government selected by the people through a democratic process, as close to democratic as is possible with the people in South Vietnam. As a result, there has been a bloody civil war going on in South Vietnam fought almost entirely with terrible weapons provided by the United States. The Viet Cong uh, fight with American weapons against uh, the uh, government forces, which also fights. The Viet Cong uh, gets its weapons by capture. They get their arms and ammunition by capture. And here we have uh, flame flamethrowers used, uh, phosphorus bombs, helicopters. The, the Vietnamese people are not responsible for these uh, terrible weapons that increase the savagery of war. And the war in South Vietnam is not just a war uh, between uh, communism, the communist nations on the one side and uh, uh, the United States on the other. It is a civil war for the most part, a civil war of the people of South Vietnam against the military, the succession of military and civilian dictatorships that we have forced upon, the, upon this country. I believe that we need to do something about it. Uh, now, what can we do? We can help our governments. Public opinion is extremely powerful. Uh, there are many things that uh, we can think of to do. One work in various ways. One way I noticed in a cartoon published in the paper day before yesterday by Lichte. It shows a girl, a standard beatnik type, uh, talking, walking along with her mother, talking. This is in a cartoon called Grin and Barrett. And she says, but Daphne is only 16 and her mother lets her get arrested in student demonstrations. <laughs> well, this this is one way of acting. Uh, writing to the president is another way of acting on matters of this sort. I remember in 1959 when my wife and I went to Geneva to talk with the three ambassadors who were discussing the possibility of a nuclear bomb test treaty. Ambassador Wadsworth of the United States, Ambassador Tsurapkin of the Soviet Union, Ambassador Sir Michael Wright of Great Britain. Ambassador Wadsworth said we could make progress and write the treaty if only we could get permission from our governments back home. You must go back and work, get your organization, the National Committee for a Sane Nuclear Policy. He was mistaken about this, it wasn't my organization, but he said, get your organization to work harder on the people. Nobody in Washington can stand up against the pressure of the public, from the public. Well now, I mentioned that Jane Addams and Emily Greenbalch, who received the Nobel Peace Prize later on, founded uh, one of the great old uh, peace organizations, the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. Just last week, the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, together with the American Friends Service Committee, the uh, uh, Turn Toward Peace, and many other organizations prepared a letter a petition to the president, and only today have I seen this and signed it myself. Dear President Johnson, 
We consider, as we are sure you do, that the election was a mandate to you to make peace, not war. Recognizing the dilemmas facing the United States in Vietnam, we believe that the war in Vietnam serves no useful purpose and already has done great damage to the good name of the United States. American lives are being lost in a war that cannot be won. The people of Vietnam are embittered by the devastation of their country and the killings. We therefore urge that you call for a ceasefire now and for negotiations for a permanent settlement. I am glad that I have a number of these that I got from the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom today, a number of these petitions on each of which there is room for names and addresses of about 10 people, and I'll put them down here. And let me tell you that President Anderson was good enough to give me permission to do this. I'll put them down here with the hope that some of you will sign them and that I can take them up and then mail them back to the um, Washington office of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. This would be a step in the right direction, These, uh, the direction of morality, too. I am glad that nations are being forced to move in the direction of morality, to get rid of the great immorality of war. This has been accomplished through the development of these terrible weapons of mass destruction that Nobel envisaged. Now there are other actions that we ought to take. Last year, the United States spent $100 million on research and development in the field of chemical and biological ways of killing people in large numbers. And probably the Soviet Union spent 100 million rubles on the same activity. Well, these are large sums of money. The Pugwash scientists in their fifth meeting said that uh, chemical and biological methods of killing people are uh, poorer, uh, not so good, by several orders of magnitude, several powers of ten, as nuclear weapons. But with further research and development, there might come a breakthrough that would make these weapons even more dangerous than the nuclear weapons. And I read a few months ago a book written by a man whom I knew during the Second World War in the Chemical Warfare Service, General Rothschild, in which he discussed the chemical and biological methods and said uh, if we can improve these, improve the nerve gases, set the fluorophosphates, improve the toxins such as botulism toxin, the viruses such as yellow fever viruses or spores such as anthrax spores, then it might be possible to liberate some of these materials in the Arctic uh, region when the wind is blowing in the right way so that they would come down over the Chinese People's Republic and kill all the 700 million Chinese, uh, leaving their steel plants and other installations, however, undamaged. But of course there are other possibilities too. It may be, if there is a breakthrough in this field, that it would be possible. You see, nuclear weapons are expensive to get going. They are cheap after you have a big enough plant set up to build them, but it costs several hundred million dollars or a billion dollars or two to get off to a good start building them at a good rate. But it may be that these chemical and biological weapons of warfare, we main ways of killing people, uh, could, if they are developed further, uh, could be manufactured very cheaply and in a small plant somewhere, perhaps by a small number of evil men in a, uh, one of the smaller countries and used to kill hundreds of millions of people. Now is the time to stop this cancer before it gets started. Once that the little malignant cell of knowledge has been introduced into the world, uh, the metastases may spread all over the earth and that may be the end of the human race. Well, I must say I'm glad that I'm speaking here at Augsburg College and that I can get in touch with students because I have uh, great confidence in the younger generation. They know more than we of the older generation know. They have more knowledge of science and they have something that we uh, don't have. I think that this is illustrated by a statement made, among other statements made by other young people, statement made and reported in the English magazine The Observer for the 15th of November 1964 
before, last Sunday, uh, questions were asked a number of young people in England, and I'll, I shall quote just one reply. It is from an 18-year-old laboratory assistant at Port Sunlight. That's where uh, the Lever Brothers soap factory is. And uh, this young man or woman said, we have made fantastic progress in every way over the past 50 years. Why shouldn't this continue? Since Cuba, even the politicians have learned to go easy over nuclear warfare. Another few years, and they might even have worked out ways of taking the threat out of the bomb. It can be worked out, I'm sure. Well, I am sure too. I believe that it can be worked out. I like to remember, I like to think about the uh, Norwegian starting, clear back in 1895, urging that treaties be made for compulsory arbitration of disputes between nations. The starting, the members of the starting believed that this could be done. They said, the starting is convinced that this idea of arbitration has the support of an overwhelming proportion of our people. Just as law and justice have long ago replaced the rule of the fist in disputes between man and man, so the idea of settling disputes among peoples and nations by arbitration is making its way with irresistible strength. More and more, war appears to the general consciousness as a vestige of prehistoric barbarism and a curse to the human race. And now we are forced to get rid of this vestige of prehistoric barbarism, this curse to the human race. And I am glad, and I hope you are too, that we live at this extraordinary time, this unique epoch in the history of the world, the demarcation between the past when we have had ever greater and greater wars with their accompaniment of death and destruction and human suffering, and the future when we are going to have no more wars in the world, when we shall replace war by a system of world law based upon ethics and morality and justice, and when we shall use the precious resources of this wonderful world in which we live for the benefit of human beings all over the world. Thank you.